see this period of about 200, 250 years with virtually no warfare. But it's the time when we have this very anomalous treatment of people. And so this anomalous treatment of people doesn't seem to have anything to do with the kind of warfare that we saw before or the kind of warfare that we saw later. And it seems to be very different than what one would predict for this kind of environment, for the number of people that were living here. So it's this 200 year interval that's really so enigmatic. It was a time of peace, but that was precisely when cannibalism occurred. The mystery continued until Turner and his colleagues began to notice a pattern. It was very interesting then to see that, that indeed almost all of his cases of uh, what he thinks um, uh, are cannibalistic events uh, fall within the distribution zone of the Chaco and Great Houses, and they fall in time uh, from about 900 to 1150, that is the time of the Chaco phenomenon. Almost all excavated Great Houses show signs of violence, and two-thirds within Chaco show signs of cannibalism. It was a major breakthrough, and it indicated that cannibalism and the Chaco Great Houses were inextricably linked. Not only was the Chaco era unique in its achievements, it was now set apart by its cannibalism. But there was something else distinct about Chaco. Turner and others saw outside influences at work here. In the architecture, there were signs of cultures from far to the south. The Mesoamericans, Toltecs and other ancient peoples from today's Valley of Mexico. Below the Chaco-style Great House of Wupatki, there is a ball court, an integral part of the Mesoamerican culture. And throughout Chaco Canyon itself, the ruins suggested to Turner a Mesoamerican influence, especially at Chetro Ketel, the largest of the great houses. It has a wall that runs through a, a block at least, a city block at least, with columns in it, with columns that are exactly like the columns you see in many Mesoamerican sites. Sometime after Chetra Kettle was built, after they built those columns, that facade, somebody filled those things in. But initially, in the early part of that, that construction, it was something like nothing had occurred here in the Southwest previously. This is so big. But when I look at this stuff, I see something here that is so much bigger than local evolution could possibly have produced. This is something that came in here. I have to have a mechanism to bring this cannibalism into the Southwest, okay? Turner was looking for something more concrete than signs of Mesoamerican influence in the Chacoan architecture. Had Mesoamericans themselves come to the canyon? And we sort of looked all over the potential kinds of evidence that we could find and it's sort of eureka we could identify Mexicans by their modified teeth because in the Valley of Mexico and throughout Mesoamerica, people modify their teeth by chipping, filing, inlaying, you know, drilling them and doing all kinds of things to them. So if we have got some individuals here in the Southwest with dental modification, the odds are very good that they're from Mexico because there is no tradition of tooth modification in California, the Great Basin, the Rocky Mountains, the Southwest, the Great Plains, you name it. Once again, re-examining the bones from here at Pueblo Benito in Chaco Canyon, Turner made a significant discovery. A single skull with filed teeth. I think we've got the direct link between Mesoamerica and the Southwest. But the direct link is dependent on just one piece of evidence, that lone skull. This may be problematic to many, but not to Turner. There is plenty of evidence for ancient violence and mistreatment of humans throughout Mesoamerica. And Turner uses this to further his controversial connection. So, what do I say? I've got a, I've got a, I've got a Mexican over here someplace with chipped teeth. I've got cannibalism in three or four rooms somewhere around here. I see Mexico. What is now Mexico City was once the capital of a vast Mesoamerican empire, and the remnants of an ancient culture offer him an explanation for the source of cannibalism back in Chaco Canyon. These are the ruins of Templo Mayor, an immense ceremonial complex built by the Aztecs, 
whose bloodthirsty reputation is part of a tradition of violence among the peoples of Mesoamerica that began centuries before Chaco. The earlier Almecs and Taltecs, along with the Aztecs, all held a deep reverence for human sacrifice and ritual consumption. Fierce and demanding deities needing to be appeased, the god and goddess of death were idols with exposed ribs and sliced organs. Aztec records attest to this cult of blood. In surviving codices, there are images of sacrifice and consumption, pictures of dismemberment, decapitation, and bodies being boiled. Early Spanish records report hearing about gruesome ceremonies in which thousands of captives were bent backwards over this dark stone slab and sacrificed to voracious gods. The still beating hearts of victims would have been deposited in this ceremonial vessel. Parts of the bodies were recorded as having been consumed by priests, investing them, they thought, with godlike qualities. And hundreds of years later, their bones ended up here. The National Museum of Anthropology and History in Mexico City houses 20,000 skeletal remains excavated from some 600 archaeological sites in Mexico. Physical anthropologist Carmen Pioan has been doing extensive taphonomic studies on Mesoamerican bones that go back to at least 500 BC. And as Pioan has studied the bones, she has found the signs of savage treatment. Ritual cannibalism, and perhaps even more bizarre processes. They thought about using the body of the sacrifice victims in any way they could. Bones were crafted into tools and ornaments. Longer bones from arms and legs were made into ritual musical instruments. And they made some deep cuts on the shaft of the, of the long bones and they played it like this. And skulls were put to use as well. A hole was punched very carefully on the bottom of the skull. The hole was this size and the mandible is his. So what I propose here is the skull was afterwards put on a pole as a trophy. And they weren't just single trophies. Carefully punching holes in the sides of the skull, the Mesoamericans would run a pole through and string many skulls together. In one find, a skull rack consisted of 170 skulls. The purpose seems clear. 